Right, excellent. Um, so that the topic tonight is flies, and I am kind of a, a, a late comer or a recent comer to the study of flies. It's really only been about the last, I don't know, four or five years that I've been paying much attention to them. But I found them to be really interesting, and they're clearly a, a group that have enormously uh, important ecological implications. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about flies generally, and then look specifically at some uh, particularly important fly families. There are a lot of them. Um, just to talk a little bit generally about flies, the, the defining characteristic of this order is that they only have two wings. Every other kind of insect has four wings, uh, although they, they don't always necessarily show it all the time. <clears throat> but flies have just two as adults, and they have these two little vestigial things that look like little lollipops in their armpit that are called halters. Um, generally speaking, flies have short antennae. That's not true of the more primitive uh, orders of flies um, or groups of flies, but it tends to be a characteristic of, of flies generally. And most flies have either sponge-like or sucking mouth parts. Of course, we know that there are a lot that, that bite and that have straw-like piercing mouth parts. Uh, a lot of the other ones really can't bite. They simply are able to take liquid food. Um, flies carry out complete metamorphosis. This is ecologically a really important thing uh, about any group, how, of what kind of metamorphosis they carry out. So they have one a larval form that hatches from the egg and the larval form really can't do much except eat. They're, they're, they're a little bit mobile, but they're not very mobile. They don't have very differentiated body parts. They're pretty much just eating, ap eating apparatuses. And when they reach maturity, they pupate. And, and after a little while, the adult fly pops out and starts the cycle again. An old, old uh, um, order of, of insects, about 250 million years old with the first appearing in the fossil record. And it's a very, very diverse group. Uh, the estimates go up to as many as a million species of, ex of flies existing in the world, um, most of which are not yet described. There are a lot of situations, I think, where there are what we think of currently as a species, a, a species. And if someone ever looked at it carefully enough, they realize it was actually eight or 10 species or maybe even more of that that were hidden within that. Uh, within that rubric. So 110 families, uh, 2,200 genera, and 17,000 known species for North America. Um, on the vineyard, who knows? I've pho photographed, uh, documented about, I would say, 40 species of flies and maybe 200 or 200, and, I mean, 40 families of flies and 200 or 250 species on the vineyard. That's probably more than the proverbial drop in the bucket, but it's far less than, than really occur here. It's probably a pretty small percentage of what actually occurs here. And as we'll be seeing, flies are highly diverse in terms of their bodily structure, their life histories, and their ecological relationships. The order as a whole has a bad reputation on the part of a, a relatively small number of bad actors. I don't mean to diminish the enormous impact that mosquitoes, for example, have as disease vectors on the human species. Uh, a lot more people uh, get killed each year by diseases carried by mosquitoes than by animals that we think of as being more dangerous, like tigers and lions and sharks. Uh, there's really no comparison there. Um, and then a, a species like uh, the uh, Califora vicinia, vicina, uh, a blowfly, which can carry diseases. They, they tend to feed on things like feces and decaying flesh and uh, rotting vegetable matter, and they can pick up germs and land on your sandwich and uh, cause illness, uh, a lot of serious illnesses. Um, but if you look at the number of species of flies that are known to cause serious problems for people, and you compare that to the number of flies that are basically beneficial, you know, well-behaved members of the ecosystem, the vast, vast, vast majority of flies are, we can think of as being beneficial or um, behaving themselves in, in, in the natural world. The flies come in enormously uh, diverse bodily forms. Um, I'm sorry, that I'm getting texts and I need to check because it might be somebody who's having problems getting in here. Pardon me for just a second.
Uh, I, I yeah, will shut my phone off. Apologies for that. Um, just an, an, an example of how bizarre flies can be in their structure. This one, a lipatina, is uh, called a deer cad. And if you look, at, we're looking down on it. This is, this is actually taken with a microscope, but we're looking down on the insect. And you can see these little stubs of wings here. The wings have actually broken off. And you can see that the insect has very uh, pronounced clasping um, claws. Um, they basically live their entire life attached to a deer. Uh, they hang under the hairs with those claws. They suck blood from the deer. They mate. They uh, lay eggs and uh, the larvae drop to the ground and uh, will eventually, if they're lucky, they'll find another deer to crawl up on. So this entire life cycle centers around a deer or a similar um, herbivorous mammal. Uh, true, the wings break off because there's no point in having wings when you're getting when you're riding around on a deer. So very bizarre uh, um, creatures. Um, a lot of flies that this is a pretty conventional looking fly, but it's worth noting that it has a very specific habitat association. This is a seaweed fly and it lives in the saline environment on a beach living in the rack line and its whole reproductive cycle centers on the rack line. Um, so they're found year round at the very edge of the ocean. And uh, I've even had them in winter sometimes. They're able to use the, the heat from decomposition in the rack line to remain active even during the winter. So very specialized fly, even though they don't look like anything special, they've evolved to live in a very specific and very hostile niche ecologically. And some flies, I think we just have to say are cute. I really can't think of a word other than that to refer to, um, to this particular uh, chloropod fly. Um, tiny, tiny little thing. It's about, oh, probably a little over an eighth of an inch, uh, three sixteenths of an inch long. Um, this, the larvae of this particular species feed on aphids underground, uh, so-called root aphids that, that feed on the roots of plants. Uh, photograph this one in my yard. So there are interesting looking flies all over the place. Uh, wherever you are, you can find flies. Um, but this is one of the more attractive ones that I've run into. I'm not sure why I'm not succeeding in getting uh, pages to shift here. Try this. All right, here we go. So the more primitive flies, and I, I will back up just a second to point out that this is a, an example of one of those flies that has very short stubby antenna. It's really only got three segments, uh, a little so-called pedicle, and then a little flange coming off here. And then you can just barely see it, a little filamentous flagella sticking off it. So that's pretty typical of all of the higher flies. But a lot of the lower flies, have long antennae with multi-segments to them. Uh, this is a characteristic of the most primitive and sort of ancestral flies, fly groups. This is a midge, it's a male, you can tell because they're the ones with the, uh, the, the, fu the fuzzy antennae, which they use to sniff out females. Um, I have no idea what kind of midge it is. A lot of the taxonomy of midges is based on their larval aquatic forms and not on adults. So it's entirely possible that even somebody who's an expert on midges wouldn't be able to tell you what this one is with any precision. Um, this is another, uh, just to show how bizarre some of these crane flies can get. Uh, Tenophora, look at the antennae on this one that are all convoluted and uh, weird uh, abdominal appendage here. Um, you can see why I mentioned the, uh, the, the halt, halt airs. The vestigial wings, that shows up pretty clearly in this one. And so does the, uh, oh good, Sharon found a, a, a web link, I'm, I'm delighted. Welcome aboard, Sharon. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't help you out there. We need to keep the show going on here. 
Um, this also shows pretty distinctly the, uh, the venation of the wings. And this is a really characteristic, a really important characteristic in flies, the pattern of veins in the wings. So if you're photographing flies for identification, it's really helpful to try to get a good clear image of that because it can often help you uh, pin down an identification. Um, I'm not going to say too much about the crane flies because it's just not a study, a group that I've studied very much. But I do feel it uh, uh, incumbent upon myself to talk a little bit about Trichocera. I think there's only one species of this family on the vineyard in the genus Trichocera. But the whole family is optimized for living during the winter. Uh, they have different proteins in their muscles than most flies do. And uh, they're able to operate, just their enzymes operate at lower temperatures. And really they're most comfortable at about 40 or 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, up around 65 degrees, some of their proteins start to denature. So they actually have a hard time surviving when it gets, when it gets really warm. Very, very common. These are out there by the, uh, the, the thousands and thousands along, for example, fire lanes in the state forest in November and December. You can also find them very readily coming into porch lights in sometimes even very cold weather. I found them in, in temperatures down to about um, probably the upper or mid 20s Fahrenheit. Um, so very highly evolved, really bizarre life cycle that is all centered on cold weather. So we're going to move on and talk about some of my favorite families of flies. And just look at some of the variety that they have and talk about some of their special adaptations. Uh, robber flies are one of my uh, most favorite groups. They're predatory with piercing mouth parts. And they have venom, which they produce and they inject into the prey, which they catch in, the, in flight ordinarily. Uh, the venom both paralyzes and eventually kills the prey item, and it also begins breaking down the proteins. Uh, remember, flies don't have chewing mouth parts, so they basically have to drink their dinner. And after they've uh, given the enzymes a few minutes to work, they can start drinking the liquefied uh, um, contents of the body of their victim out through their proboscis and basically drinking through a straw. Uh, it's a fairly diverse family. They range in size from quite small to quite big, and they tend to be very spiny, although that's not always true. And they are all predatory, and they're all equipped with a biting proboscis. This is one of the very most common ones. You undoubtedly have this one in your yard, Dioctria hyalpenis. Uh, they take smaller insects. It's not a big dragonfly or a robber fly. It's about a half inch long. And they tend to prey on leaf hoppers and other really small, uh, small insects. They like to perch on the tip of a leaf and just wait for a, a, in ambush for a potential victim to come by. They're really good at, the, uh, at coordinating their movements in the air. They just sort of calculate the trajectory of their, uh, their intended victim and they launch and they pick it off out of the air and they return to their perch and they begin eating it. This is another really common uh, Amadeus tibialis, a really common fly, even in settled areas on the vineyard. You probably have this one in your yard as well. And you can't quite see it here because this little doohickey is right in the middle of what I need to show you and I can't seem to make it move. But one characteristic of this genus is that that third segment of the antenna, you can kind of see it just a little bit is fuzzy. It's got feathery uh, plume, plumes on it, uh, what is called pectinate in biology speak. And apparently that's the only genus in North America that has pectinate antennae. So if you get a really good photograph, that's a character, another characteristic that you want to uh, get a clear image of is the antennae because it would be really helpful for identification. The genus Lafria, um, this is Lafria thoracica, uh, are among our largest and most impressive robber flies. This, this species is about an inch long. They're, they're, they're pretty massive insects. And generally speaking, this genus mimics uh, bumblebees pretty closely. Um, they perch on leaves, and I think the, the, the bumblebee imitation is probably primarily a protective measure. 
They do prey on bees, so it may help them uh, get close to their, their prey items. Now, this is a widespread and pretty much a generalist species. It occurs in a lot of habitats, but here's a Lafria that's much more specialized, a Lafria champlainii. It's actually named after uh, an entomologist named Champlain, not after the lake, which I was a little disappointed to hear about. But uh, again, very, very big robber fly and the characteristic mark on it are these sort of anvil shaped black marks on the, the first three segments of the abdomen. Uh, this is obviously a mating pair. Uh, the female is the bigger one and the male is the smaller one, which is typical. She needs to have a big abdomen for, for producing eggs. Uh, every Lafria champlainii I've seen has been perched on a scrub oak. This is a species that is really restricted to sand plain uh, barrens habitats. So it's very much a vineyard specialty. Uh, we seem to have probably the best population of it in Massachusetts and maybe in New England. It's a fairly common fly out there in the state forest. A very, very strong habitat association with sandy barrens. Don't know why that is. It may be that they lay their eggs in the ground and they need the right kind of sand or something, but for whatever reason, that's where you find it. The genus of Faria is a big one. And one of the characteristics of it is that most of the males have this kind of shoe-like or boot-like appendage. It varies a little bit from species to species, but they pretty much all have a, a, a boot on their butt. Uh, this is probably our most common and widespread robber fly on the vineyard. Here it is uh, on the shingles of our house, eating a leaf hopper of some description. Uh, very, very common and, and uh, easy to identify when you see it. It's the only, uh, probably one of the few members of the genus that we have here. And uh, here is what a female looks like. They have this long uh, blade-like organ called an ovipositor at the end of their abdomen. And in general, with robber flies, the appendages, either the ov ovipositor or the appendages at the end of a male abdomen, are really, really important for identification. Uh, each species has characteristic forms there. So again, if you're photographing robber flies for ID, you want to get the clearest images that you can from the top and from the side. Um, this is a, a female Afaria estrums uh, ovipositing in the uh, dried out seed head of spotted knapweed. They're pretty ecumenical in what they try to oviposit on. Um, they've tried to do it on my jeans. Uh, they've tried to do it on um, other kinds of flower heads that I've seen. Um, and this is another one of the, maybe the only other member of the genus that we have on the, the vineyard. It's a Feria alba barbus, which means white bearded. And you can kind of see why that is. The, the long hair around the face is, is white on this species. And this is a beach species. These are, are, for whatever reason, they occur pretty much only on barrier beaches uh, on, on the vineyard. And elsewhere, they seem to occur on uh, sand close to water, uh, wherever wherever they turn up. Uh, pretty common uh, where, where they do occur. I took this one on Norton Point, I think. And you often find that species with Stichopogon trifasciata, uh, an, another uh, beach dwelling. It's a little bit smaller than a feria, um, but they often intermingle on the beach and feed on the same insects. And you can find both of these species in, in uh, mid to late summer. Um, not so much up in the dunes as on the upper beach and not so much down you know, below the low tide line. They like dry sand, but they are uh, very, very much limited to that habitat on the vineyard. Um, also a, a habitat specialist is this weird looking creature called Certipogon marginalis, characterized by these knob-like things on its thorax and by really dense hair over its almost its entire body. Uh, this is another dry sand uh, robber fly. I almost always find them perched on the ground and they're almost all, the ones that I found have almost all been in the state forest along a fire lane. So they really like um, sand plain habitats. It's another, uh, another habitat specialist. Um, in addition to having specialization for habitats, robber flies often have specialization for the that, prey that they take. Um, Asylus sericeus, for example, 
seems to feed exclusively on butterflies, as far as I can tell. It will stake out a, a patch of milkweed or in this case, a patch of uh, winged sumac that was in bloom. And butterflies will come in to, the, uh, to nectar on those flowers and a silus will draw a bead on one of those and pick it off and land and uh, um, do its thing with injecting venom and draining the, uh, the, the, the bodily contents. This, in this case, it's with an American lady, a uh, pretty good sized butterfly. So you can see that this is a pretty good sized butterfly as well. Um, and Proctocanthus, another very large genus of very large robber flies, seems to feed almost exclusively on bees and wasps. And I've seen it take uh, even stinging wasps like uh, yellow jackets, which it picks out of the air and the venom is so strong and so well tailored to Hymenoptera that it immobilizes, it usually has immobilized the prey before it lands again. So it just takes a matter of seconds to immobilize a, a wasp or a bee that they've taken. Um, we can move on to another family, Surfidae, or the hoverflies. These are very, uh, some of the most beautiful flies and some of the most important ones uh, in terms of ecological impacts. They have a variety of roles that they play. Um, fairly diverse family, many of them are brightly colored and a large number of them mimic bees or wasps in their coloration. Um, adults are notorious for taking pollen or nectar from flowers, so you get them visiting flowers all the time. And because of that, they function as pollinators and that's one of their most important um, uh, functions in the world. Uh, this is a sort of typical surfed fly. Uh, you, you recall I mentioned the, the, the spurious vein here. Uh, it's a vein in the wing that kind of doesn't go anywhere. You can see it right here on this individual. That's the spurious vein, which is a characteristic. It, it moves around a bit on the wing, but it's a characteristic of all of the surfed flies. Um, this one is probably in the genus surface. There, uh, there are a couple of other genera that look very much like it. And, and to be honest, I've never really spent the time necessary to learn how to sort them out. But they all tend to have this uh, bee-like, uh, wasp-like coloration that uh, probably lends them some protection. Um, all right, here's another, uh, another kind of surfing fly, Euromyas stipata. Um, and it's demonstrating two of the roles that these flies play. It's on the one hand, it's a, it's a prey item here for a crab spider, which is, has caught it and is, is, uh, has killed it and is eating it. And it's also dusted with pollen. I think this is a buttercup that it's on. I took this photo at the Hoft farm a couple of years ago. Uh, and this flies like this were fairly common visiting buttercups. And you can see it's carrying quite a bit of pollen. I don't think that flies are, surfing flies are generally as efficient as pollinators as bees are because their bodies aren't as hairy. But that's a fair amount of pollen to be transporting around. So they do function as pollinators. And that's a very ecologically important thing. The larvae of many surfing flies are predatory with uh, a lot of them preying on aphids. This is not my photograph. I swiped it off of bug guide. But I think the aphids are probably oleander aphids, which are a species that are very, very common on butterfly weed. You often get them clustered on seed pods on butterfly weed. And this is the, the sort of amorphous, not very uh, advanced body of a uh, surfed larva of some kind. And they simply crawl around pretty much at random and when they contact something that feels like an aphid, they bite it and they drain the juices out of it. And they can be pretty effective aphid control. They have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of growing to do, and so they need to take a lot of prey during their larval stage. So surfids are really popular with gardeners because gardeners don't like aphids and they do like pollination. And this is a group that performs both of those services very effectively. Uh, again, this is probably in the genus surface. I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, these, uh, this is an early spring species. Um, a lot of surfing flies are very small, like Allograpta obliqua. 
to give an indication of the size here, this is on uh, the uh, uh, blossom of a, um, not a cosmos, begins with a C. It'll come to me, Coriopsis in our front yard. Um, so it's a, it's a tiny little fly, probably a quarter of an inch long or maybe less. A uh, very distinctive pattern on the end of the abdomen here, so you can always uh, recognize the species pretty readily. And here is a, an Allograpta obliqua egg, which it laid on a million bell plant in one of our uh, containers at home. The only reason I know that's what this is, is I saw the fly actually lay that egg, so I know what uh, species it came from. But note that there are aphids present, the, the female fly, flying around with a leg of, uh, with a, uh, an abdomen full of fertile eggs, found a plant that had aphids on it and laid her egg there so that when it hatched, uh, the larva would be able to find prey quite readily. Another very small and very, very common uh, genus here is Toxomerus. We have three species. Um, this one happens to be Geminatus, but the other three are, other two are pretty common. And again, very small. This is an American holly blossom that it's on, uh, not much more than a quarter of an inch across. Um, and again, uh, pollinator and aphid hunter. Um, and in addition to being uh, having native serpent flies, we have a pretty high number of introduced ones. Uh, this is a species introduced from Europe, probably accidentally. It just came in with some kind of agricultural product. Um, I refer to it as the, the bike racer uh, fly because it's got this really enlarged femur. Um, it, it is, again, uh, the, the, the text here is hidden, but this is uh, Cerita pipiens. And it was really fun when I was in England a few years ago because this very same fly was flying around in the garden at the house we were staying in. I had been flying in my yard in Oak Bluffs and I found the exact same fly, which is kind of enjoyable. Again, to give a sense of the size, this is on a Coreopsis flower. And then there are several members of the genus Aristolus that are introduced. I don't know which one this is. There are also some native species. And this one, you can see again, the, the um, spurious vein pretty clearly in this photograph. Um, and this is on an oxide daisy. Uh, so it's a, a picking up pollen, you can see it's actually got some pollen on its eye and on the hairs of its abdomen from, from the uh, feeding that it's doing. And a lot of the Aristalis species have, uh, in fact, I think probably all of them have aquatic larvae, which look more or less like this. And they're sometimes referred to as rat-tailed maggots, which is not a, a, a term uh, calculated to produce a, a big popular support. But this is a siphon, basically. They can breathe air through this siphon, so they don't need to get oxygen out of the water. And what that means is they can tolerate really bad water quality. Um, it can be, uh, you know, uh, really full of garbage and uh, uh, depleted oxygen, and they're able to just exist as detritivores in the water in pretty much any kind of conditions, regardless of how bad the water quality is. And finally, some of the uh, serpent flies are extremely good wasp mimics. Uh, this one, Spilomia longicornis, uh, is uh, just very, very convincing. It looks like a yellow jacket. You can easily mistake it. They even often um, perch with their legs out in front of them. It's not really showing in this character, in this picture, but with their legs out in front of them so that the legs resemble the uh, long antennae of a, of a wasp. And then Milesia virginiensis is another one that's a pretty good uh, mimic of, of wasps. And then finally, uh, just this is Chalcosurfus piger. Uh, and anybody recognize the plant this is on? Chime in if you do. Um, it's called colic root. And uh, it's not a plant that I see many things, many pollinators on. And I suspect this may be a plant that is actually pollinated more by flies than by anything else. And there are some plants like that. Uh, the arrangement of the stamens and uh, the, the size of the flower, uh, it looks to me like a, a fly like this one has to get its face really into those stamens and pick up a lot of pollen when it feeds on this 
um, this flower, which is a member of the lily family that occurs out in sand plain habitats in the state forest. So this very elegant fly, jet black with a, a red abdomen, may be an important pollinator for this, uh, this, this species of plant. I like to think it is anyway. Uh, we'll pass relatively quickly through the bee flies. Um, primarily, uh, the adults visit pollen, flowers for pollen, and the larvae are parasitic on a variety of insect hosts. Um, uh, some of these, uh, this is a, a typical bee fly with a fuzzy body, it looks kind of like a bee, and a long proboscis, which looks menacing, but in fact is not. Uh, they don't, they use that for sipping nectar, they don't bite with it, they're incapable of biting, in fact. So perfectly benign insects, although they have a pretty uh, daunting piece of apparatus in their front. Uh, this is hey, one- Hey, Matt. Yeah, Karen. Did, did that bee have double wings? It doesn't. Uh, it's got- It, it just kind of looks like it? Yeah, it does look like this. It looks like there is a, a, a lobe here of the wing that almost looks like a separate part of the wing, but if you looked at it under a scope, you'd see that it is, a, it is one continuous um, wing. You can be sure all flies, it's an, in, an invariable rule. They just have the one pair of wings, but that's very sharp observation on your part. That's a good well, question. Well, because I'm wondering, you know, like they look so much like bees. Is it really the wings that to my eye is going to be able to differentiate mm -hmm. it from a bee? Is that it, you look for the, two, the single wing? It may be that as part of their adaptation uh, to look like bees, that they actually have developed a single wing that makes it look like a, there is a double wing. They may have taken it that far. I don't know, I'm speculating now that that seems entirely possible. But a better way to tell that this is a fly is the very, very large eyes, that there isn't any hymenopteran that has eyes that cover up that much of the head. So that's sometimes a better field mark for distinguishing them. Um, Bombylius major it doesn't uh, it is a very very common fly. This is one of the earliest flies that we uh, that we find in the spring, as early as I guess about the second week in April. Uh, you probably know that uh, Epigeus rep Epigea repens or trailing arbutus is a very early spring flower, and it's a, it's probably pollinated by this fly in addition to several other things. Um, that doesn't show up terribly well in this angle, but the, the wing is bicolored in this species. The forward half of the wing is dark and the rear half of the wing is uh, transparent. And you'll see these if you walk along, for example, the fire lanes in the state forest in April, you'll see these uh, by the score uh, hovering a foot or two off the ground and looking either for a place to nectar or looking for a solitary bee burrow. Uh, a lot of um, uh, bee flies parasitize solitary bees, often by uh, laying uh, eggs right at the burrow or at the mouth of the burrow. Um, a lot of other ones parasitize tiger beetles like Anthrax georgicus. And it's really fun to watch these things uh, hunt. They, they tool around a foot or so off the ground, just flying erratically along open habitat. And they are looking for uh, tiger beetle larval burrows. And when they find one, they make a series of little swooping uh, dive bombing um, moves on that burrow. And with each of those dives, they squeeze off an egg. And eventually one of those eggs will hit the burrow or hit close enough to the mouth of it so that the larva, when it hatches, is able to get into the burrow and um, crawl down and parasitize the larval tiger beetle. It will eventually kill the tiger beetle by, by eating it. Um, now Dipalta serpentina is a parasite, parasite of antlions of all things. They apparently parasitize the pupa, the pupae of antlions. Um, bizarre ecological association. I mean, who would have thought of that? But there you have it. And uh, this genus Villa, uh, you can't really identify them to species from photographs. This might be Villa arenosa, but I wouldn't want to push my luck. But the genus parasitizes a wide range of insects, from butterflies and moths to horseflies to beetles, and even in some cases, ants, apparently. So 
uh, very diverse. And, and typically they, they may lay their eggs either close to the larval uh, where, the, where the larvae are, or they may actually lay them uh, right on the insect that they're parasitizing. And finally, this is a really bizarre uh, bee fly, Cystropus macer, which has evolved mimicry to those wasps, the, the thin-waisted wasps that you often see, Amophila, uh, landing on milkweeds during the summer and, and other pollen sources. I have no idea why a fly that parasitizes slug, cat, slug moth caterpillars evolved mimicry of Amophila, a wasp genus, there undoubtedly is a really good reason for it. I just don't happen to know what it is, and I don't really know if anybody else does. Um, <clears throat> again, a pretty small family that I'd like to talk about a little bit is Canopidae, or the thick-headed flies. Um, adults are uh, primarily bee-like or wasp-like in their appearance, and many of the larvae are parasites on bees, and I think this is a really good example of that. This is Physocephala tibialis, and it's nectaring or taking pollen on a, a, a butterfly weed flower cluster. And you can see it is quite wasp-like in its appearance. It even has evolved long wasp-like antennae, although you can see they only have the three sections of uh, and, and tiny segments that are characteristic of the higher flies, but it's a pretty good wasp mimic. And here is a female one. And if you look at this end of the abdomen, there is this uh, modification here that looks like a can opener, kind of. You could sort of imagine opening a bottle with that. And there is good reason for that. It is a bottle opener, in effect. The way these uh, reproduce, is a female will spot a bee in the air, and it can be a bee of any of several species. I think they probably specialize in uh, bumblebees and maybe Andrina mining bees, which are fairly large. But the female fly will spot a, a bee in the air, launch and catch her, and instantly, it, it, takes, it, it happens faster than you can see, actually. She will use this little hook on her abdomen to pry apart the uh, couple of the abdominal segments on, the, on that bee. And she will inject an egg into the abdomen of the bee and then just leave. And the egg will hatch. It's already inside the bee effectively. It's tucked under a piece of exoskeleton. And when it hatches, it eats its, it's the rest of the way into the bee and literally eats the bee from the inside out. Um, they get to be quite large by the time they're uh, ready to emerge. And again, this is invariably fatal to the bee. So uh, not good if you like bees, but very good if you like interesting biology and interesting morphological modifications. Uh, Myopa vicaria, this is another canopid that uh, uh, apparently parasitizes honey and mining bees. And zodian, which is uh, another small canopid, again, the same deal, parasitizes bees of various kinds. Um, again, you'll find these uh, hanging out with bees on flowers, and the adults will be eating pollen. You can see this, this has a very long, uh, extensible mouth part here, so she's probably taking um, nectar from the flowers on this composite uh, oxide, oxide daisy flower head. Um, so really bizarre biology of some of these flies. And then finally, I'd like to talk about one of the most ecologically important species, the tachinidae, or tachinids, or bristle flies. We'll see why they're called that in just a moment. But it's a very, very large and diverse family, um, 10,000 species known worldwide. And again, uh, that is probably a dramatic understatement of how many species are actually out there in the world. It's probably 10 times that at least. It's a characteristic of the family that the larvae are parasitic. It can be a parasitic on a wide range of species. Um, it can, the the uh, particular tachinid species can be host specific. It can use only one uh, insect species as its host, or they can be quite generalist and use uh, a variety of them. And they have a range of strategies for getting their eggs in contact or get close enough to their, uh, their larval hosts. 
Um, so they're a highly diverse family. And adults of many species, I would say probably of most or all in this genus, um, visit flowers for, uh, for pollen and nectar. They look a little bit in general like, uh, like house flies because they are closely related and, uh, to the blowflies and house flies, which are uh, families in the same branch of the business. Uh, this is a, a, another image that I cribbed off of Bug Guide. But we've got this massive Cecropia moth caterpillar and a bunch of relatively small uh, tachinid flies. And you can see these white dots are all eggs that the tachinid flies have simply pasted to the exterior of this caterpillar. And that caterpillar is a goner. Uh, it's going to live for a while. But one of these, um, or more than one of these uh, tachinid eggs will hatch and the larva will burrow its way in. As they grow, they will start to compete with each other and eventually only one will survive, but it will continue to grow and feed on the, <clears throat> the organs and the tissues and the juices of this caterpillar. And then when the, uh, the larva, the fly larva is mature, it will simply chew its way out again and go and pupate in the leaf litter somewhere. Uh, some of them pupate inside the dead insect, some of them emerge, depends on the, on the species. But um, so that's what it looks like. This is an action shot of, of a very large caterpillar being parasitized by a very small fly. Uh, this is a sort of uh, general tachinid. They, they often look uh, housefly-like. They belong to a super family of flies called Astroidea which is characterized by this angle in a wing vein here. Uh, so they're closely related to blowflies, a little bit less closely related to the houseflies, but um, the general appearance is pretty similar across all of those families. Uh, collectively, those families that I've just mentioned, along with a few others, are called caloptrate flies. And that's because of this flange here that you can see showing through the wing. It's called a calipter. Uh, it doesn't really have any function that anybody knows about, but it's uh, a little membranous organ that these flies have and apparently is a characteristic of this cluster of families. The reason these are called bristle flies, tachinids, is because almost all of the species have really pronounced bristles on the abdomen. And of course, even house flies are somewhat bristly, but as we'll see in a minute, uh, tachinid flies take this to the, uh, to the extreme in how bristly they can be. Um, they're very, very difficult to identify from photographs. Uh, I don't even know what subfamily this one is in. Uh, somebody who knows tachinids well could probably get it to genus pretty readily, but a, a lot of the characteristics that distinguish species in genera are difficult to capture in photographs. It's often how many bristles, you know, on a, a particular piece of exoskeleton on the side of the thorax has. Uh, literally, it's that level of detail. And those characteristics are very, very hard to capture in a photograph. And because so many tachinids share this sort of grayish housefly-like look, um, you can you can be way off when you identify tachinids. You can miss the subfamily uh, very, very easily when you're identifying them from photographs. So you really, in order to get any precision, you really do need to have a specimen to work with. Talk about bristles. I think this is in the genus Archytus. I could be wrong about that. A really strongly bristled creature here. Um, and it's a parasitite, parasite of various moth species. It probably lays its eggs on the caterpillars. Uh, I don't know how specific it is. It may specialize in one particular family. That's often the case, um, you know, noctuid moths or something like that. Um, this is on, it looks like it's on um, mountain mint. So uh, happily eating away and um, getting ready to look for uh, some hosts to lay eggs on if it's a female. Um, this one is a fly tachinid that you can identify pretty readily. The, the protuberant face is a characteristic, and this little white mark on the abdomen is uh, a useful field mark. It's, it's a palpus signifer, 
And this is a species that is very, very common in early spring, uh, for example, out in the state forest. Um, I, I go out early in the, in the season before most people are probably even thinking about insects and find a lot of these species out there already doing their thing. Um, and this is a, 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 a tachinid that uses noctuid moths. Uh, uh, a lot of the, the cutworm moths overwinter as caterpillars and they come out as the weather warms at the same time that adult epalpus emerge. And so the timing is great. Um, so this is a very beneficial fly. <coughs> Excuse me, it, it would parasitize things like cutworms in your garden if it came across them. And it's also a very active pollinator. Um, I noticed, particularly this spring, but I've noticed in the past that when you find a patch of bearberry, um, Arctostaphylus, um, out in, in the state forest or wherever, there will be a few bees on it but there will probably be many, many more um, Eupalpus on it than there are bees. There isn't much in bloom at that time of year, of course, we're talking the second, third week of April. So whatever is in bloom attracts any kind of pollinators that are out and active at that time. And just the fact that this species turned up in great numbers, uh, sometimes you'd find 30 or 40 of them on a small patch of bearberry makes me think that they probably are a very, very important pollinator for that species. And that plant is an important one. I mean, it's, it's the host species for a relatively rare butterfly called the frosted elfin. Um, so it all hangs together and these flies are performing an important ecological service uh, with whatever aspects of their life they're doing. Here's another uh, very easy to identify um, uh, early season fly. It's Gonia is the genus. Um, I have been able to identify a few of these. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the species, but um, the, I think, as I recall, it was the color of the antennae that was the important characteristic here. I refer to this as old tennis ball head um, because they have this remarkable fuzzy uh, um, head shape, uh, round and fuzzy. And again, this is, a, this is an early season fly. They, uh, they probably parasitize a variety of moths, but they also parasitize blister beetles, and they may uh, actually be putting their um, eggs on adult blister beetles because there's a lot of blister beetle species that are active early in the spring when this fly is out. And again, this is a very, very common fly if you're out in April or into early May. And you can see these by the hundreds in the state forest if you're, if you're interested. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, most tachinids have bristly abdomens. Well, there are excep exceptions to every rule. In gymnosoma, and that this literally means naked body, is one genus that has almost no bristles at all on it. Um, it's just, they fly during the summer. There are parasites of, uh, uh, parasites of bugs. And um, this is getting to be very important, uh, the, the parasitism on, on bugs, and I mean hemiptera, I'm using bugs specifically in the sense of stink bugs and things like that, because we're starting to see more and more hemiptera that are uh, problematic from the human perspective, things like the um, brown marmorated stink bug, which is an agricultural pest and also is annoying simply because they come inside in winter in very large numbers. Um, and the spotted lanternfly, which is not yet established in Massachusetts, but is another hemipteran that is uh, introduced here and starting to be an agricultural pest. So having uh, insects that are parasites on hemiptera is going to be, I think, progressively more important as time goes by. These are going to be important species for controlling um, some of these potential pests. Uh, here's another beautiful, beautiful fly, um, uh, Trichopoda penipes. Um, uh, again, it's a, a parasite on uh, bugs of, of various kinds. I don't know what specifically they use on the vineyard. But one of the characteristics of this genus are these peculiar uh, comb-like hairs, um, the hind tibia. Um, all the members of the genus have it, and uh, it's just a bizarre feature. I, I, I don't know why it occurs, and I don't know if there has ever been uh, 
convincing explanation for that feature. Um, closely related to that, uh, Cylindromyia propusilla. This one at least has a few spines on it to make it look like a tachinid. And again, you can see the, um, uh, it, this is the, the halter and the calipter. They are characteristics of flies and then of calyptrate flies generally. Um, and again, it's, it's unusual, but this is really a generalist um, fly. They use everything from stink bugs to grasshoppers, um, which is, uh, when you think about it, pretty amazing because in order to be an endoparasite, to be a parasite inside the body of another insect, uh, it probably had the larva of the fly probably has to have some pretty specific enzymes uh, and protective measures to, to, to defend itself against the immune system of the host. So a lot of versatility to be a generalist like this. And then uh, Xanthan melanodes arctuatus, Ar arctuatus uh, again. And I included this one because the host is not known. And that is actually a characteristic of a large number of tachinids, probably the majority of them. They've never been studied. Uh, eventually what will happen is that somebody who's studying something else will find a parasitized individual of some grasshopper or bug that, that he's studying or she is studying. And they will wait in to see what comes out and it will be lo and behold, Xanthomelanodes. And then we will know what the species is. Or alternatively, somebody might be studying this fly and it may follow females around until it sees them laying an egg on something. But uh, the, probably the majority of tachinids, the host is not known. So there is a lot of research yet to be done. And this is an area where even an amateur uh, observer can make significant contributions to science. If you get a picture of a tachinid fly laying an egg on something, you may have, um, been the, been the first person to learn what that particular tachinid species is parasitizing. <clears throat> I'm going to finish up with two, uh, before my voice fails entirely, with two very important flies. Uh, this is Compsilura, and it's a, it's a non-native species in North America. And it was one of the very first instances of what are known as biocontrol agents. Uh, it was a species that was deliberately introduced to control another exotic species that had become a pest. Uh, in this case, it was specifically the brown-tailed moth, which has uh, caterpillars that have irritating hairs that can cause a horrible rash. <clears throat> and that was introduced here and got to be kind of out of control. So biologists thought, well, Compsilura parasitizes uh, brown-tailed moths. So let's just introduce the parasite and that'll take care of our problem. And it did, it worked really well. It knocked the, uh, the brown-tailed moth back to a sort of background level. Uh, and then Compsilura demonstrated a lot of versatility and it started parasitizing a bunch of other things because in fact, it was a generalist. It wasn't a specific, uh, host specific to Kennedy. And the, the flies that, it, the, the uh, moths that it uh, hammered the most turned out to be those wonderful big uh, silk moths like Prometheus and Luna and um, uh, all those wonderful gigantic silk moths that are so beautiful. And Compsilura is widespread in New England and that's one of the reasons that silk moth populations have crashed across the New England region. But Compsilura has never been documented on Martha's Vineyard. It was never introduced here and it apparently has never gotten here. And this is probably the main reason why our silk moth populations are the envy of the rest of New England. We have so many Luna moths here. And the main reason for that is probably that we don't have Compsilura on the vineyard. Things have progressed since then, and we are continuing to have problems with introduced moths that get out of control. But we've learned about biocontrol agents and we no longer are as haphazard as they were back in the 30s or 40s, whenever it was that Compsilura was, it was introduced. Uh, this is Cyzenus albicans. And you're all familiar with the winter moth, uh, Operoptera brumata, which was introduced a couple of places in North America, um, but spread to the vineyard uh, probably 15 to 20 years ago. 
And when it has an outbreak, it really can defoliate oak forest. Uh, it, the uh, uh, larval caterpillars feed in the spring and they defoliate oak trees and they can cause lots of oak mortality. A uh, very big pest problem. They can also, uh, they feed on other species as well. They can be a pest in uh, blueberry barrens because they will eat blueberry leaves. So people began, as it started to become prevalent here, biologists started looking for biocontrol agents, but they didn't want to make the same mistake that they made with Comsolura. They didn't want to bring a generalist in. They wanted to bring in a really host-specific fly to take it on. And Cyzenus albicans fit the bill. Apparently what happens is the female Cyzenus lays eggs just sort of randomly around the vegetation on um, oak trees. And when a um, winter moth caterpillar is feeding, it may accidentally ingest one of those eggs. And it is the saliva in the, uh, in the mouth parts of the caterpillar triggers that egg to hatch. And there's a very specific wow. enzyme in the, uh, in the saliva that triggers the hatching. And then you've got a caterpillar inside the uh, winter moth, uh, I mean, a, a fly larva inside the winter moth caterpillar, and it grows and it feeds and it eventually kills the, uh, the caterpillar. So it's proven to be a very, very effective biocontrol agent. And because of this very specific biochemical relationship that it has with its host, uh, there is very little fear that we have that of, of this fly beginning to impact any, uh, any other non-target organisms. They've offered it the opportunity to parasitize another member of that genus, Operoptera. Uh, we have a native one called Operoptera bruciata, very, very close relative of the winter moth. You can't even tell the adults apart most of the time in appearance. And uh, Cyzenus was having none of that. It, it was not able to reproduce, uh, not able to survive within um, uh, that particular species of Opteroptera. So we have learned a lot and biocontrol uh, apparently is an effective strategy for um, that winter moth. So that's what I got for you tonight. Um, I'd like to thank the Betsy and Jesse Fink Family Foundation, which has funded the Atlas of Life. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, thank all the people who have been contributing data to iNaturalist from the vineyard because that's an important source of data for the, the Atlas of Life as we try to assess the, uh, document the um, biodiversity of the vineyard. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming along and uh, you've all heard me say this now at this point, there's my email address. Feel free to use it if you have an interesting sighting, if you have a photo of something you'd like me to try to identify. If you have a question, um, I'm, that's what I'm here for. This is literally part of my job is helping people learn about the natural world. So I am um, at your disposal. If there are any questions, I see there is a, a, something posted in chat here. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Sharon. She says she will be careful who she swats in the future. We all should be careful because there are uh, lots of beneficial insects out there. Any questions that I can answer at this point, or are we all ready for dinner? Um, just uh, I have a question. Yourself and chime in if you'd like to say anything. Yeah, Karen. I have a. Yeah, you can hear me. I can't tell. Um, this uh, Cyzenus that is the biocontrol for the winter moth. Mm -hmm. When we spray for the winter moth, does it affect that fly? Uh, yes. The, uh, the problem with spraying for insects is, well, it depends on what you use. It, it depends on what you're using. If you're using a conventional insecticide, yes, it might impact uh, the fly. Um, if you're using something like Bt, which is a, a bacillus, a, a bacterium that uh, infects specific kinds of larvae, then no, it probably would not. So it would depend on what's, what kind of uh, insecticide was being used to control litter moths. And I guess I can also stop sharing my screen at this point. And um, is there any hope in us getting photographs like this with an iPhone or is that your special fly cam? Well, this was not my fly. I, I stole this one from bug fight. The other ones were mostly taken with um, a, a macro lens. Um, 
there are some, uh, there we go. Uh, there are some uh, iPhones that produce very, very good uh, Macro stuff. Zoom, yeah. Um, trying to get my, uh, well, we're almost done here, so it doesn't really matter. You can, you can look at the, the pit orchestra from uh, uh, Guys and Dolls a few years ago uh, on my desktop. If you're, I'm, stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, other questions? All right, I think we will wrap it up at this point then. Um, I really appreciate your taking the time to join me this evening. I appreciate your interest in insects. I hope I've persuaded you that flies are unfairly maligned and that they deserve a lot more respect than we generally give them. And I look forward to seeing some uh, fly pictures that, that I hope some of you will be able to, to snap off in the near future. So thanks again, uh, have a great evening and I really appreciate your, your having been here.